Well, good morning, and may I add my welcome uh, to Sarah's, to all who are watching us at home this morning. Well, it's week four in our series, Journeying Through the First Letter of John, a series which will take us almost up to the end of Lent. And over the last three weeks, we've discovered that this letter was written to combat two dangerous ideas that have been taking root in the early church. Firstly, that false teachers were spreading the idea around that Jesus had not been a real human being. And John is writing to correct that. If you have your Bibles open at 1 John chapter 2, you'll see that the first few verses of today's reading, verses 12 to 14, are actually offset on the page, kind of in the middle, a bit like a quote. And this is what John Stott calls a digression. A digression, of course, is when somebody speaking or writing kind of goes off track a little bit from the main subject or the topic and often says at the end of that, anyway, I digress when they get back on track. And that's what John's doing here. In this particular digression, in verses 12 to 14, John interrupts the flow of his writing to restate a set of truths to remind his readers. And you'll notice that he writes to three distinct groups. Number one, dear children, number two, fathers, and number three, young men. And we're told here that John isn't being uh, ageist, or even sexist, as he's not addressing different age groups, but instead is referring to them in their various stages of spiritual development. So dear children is a kind of inclusive reference to all church members who are newborn in Christ. Whilst young men represents more developed Christians, and then fathers are those who've reached a depth of wisdom and maturity in the Christian faith. And you'll see that as we move on to verses 15 to 17, John then um, returns to his main point after this particular digression. And it's here that he tackles the second of those dangerous ideas circulating in the early church that some people were saying that Christians could live as they liked, that morality, morality didn't matter at all. And it's this second dangerous idea that I'm going to try and focus on today. John writes, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Unlike many of the letters in the New Testament, this first letter of John isn't addressed to any particular individual or church community. It may well have been a kind of circular letter written to a number of churches, all experiencing the same sort of issues. Which I think makes the application of what John has to say even more significant for us today. And whilst, of course, the culture has changed beyond recognition since John first wrote this letter, the central issues are certainly still with us. May we please pray. Father God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts, to illuminate our thinking, and align our actions with your kingdom values. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you've ever been on an Alpha course, 
you may be familiar with a story which is often told in the last session. And the story features a young police officer who was taking his final exam at police college before graduation. He worked his way through all the questions on the paper. And then he came to the final one, which invited potential officers to put themselves into a real life scenario, asking what would they do in this situation? And here's the question that was on the paper. You are on patrol in outer London when an explosion occurs in a gas main in a nearby street. On investigation, you find that a large hole has been blown in the footpath and that there is an overturned van lying nearby. Inside the van, there is a strong smell of alcohol. Both occupants, a man and a woman, are injured. You recognize the woman as the wife of your divisional inspector, who is at present away in the United States. A passing motorist stops to offer you assistance, but you realize that he is a man who's wanted for armed robbery. Suddenly, another man runs out of a nearby house shouting that his wife is expecting a baby and the shock of the explosion has made the birth imminent. Another man is crying for help, having been blown into an adjacent canal by the explosion, and he can't swim. Bearing in mind the provisions of the Mental Health Act, describe in a few words what actions you would take. The police officer thought for a moment, picked up his pen and wrote, I would, take up my, I would take off my uniform and mingle with the crowd. Well, we can certainly sympathize with his answer. As a Christian, it's often tempting to, as it were, take off the uniform and mingle with the crowd. To be like everyone else because it's so much easier but we're called to remain distinctive, to retain our Christian identity and morality wherever we are and whatever the circumstances, especially when people can't see us. John's teaching here is pretty sober stuff. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, Love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Of course, when we hear phrases such as lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes, they can sound a bit ancient and outdated. And we might think that we mistakenly consign these things um, to the past and a world which is very different than our own. I think the message version paraphrase helps us to read it again through more contemporary eyes. Don't love the world's ways. Don't love the world's goods. Love of the world squeezes out love for the Father. Practically everything that goes on in the world Wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. And in this passage, you can't but help notice that the focus of John's advice here is all about warnings of the world he mentions it six times. And in both John's gospel and his letters, he uses the world as referring to fallen humanity, hostile to God. And in this passage, he commands not to love the world is grounded on two arguments. 
Firstly, that love for the world and love for God the Father are incompatible. I don't know about you, but like us, you probably have a variety of gadgets and devices at home which run on battery power and need charging regularly. And it drives us mad that devices, even made by the same manufacturer, have different chargers, even though they may look the same. They're simply not compatible. They won't work. And so it is, says John, that love for the world has to offer is not compatible with the life that God the Father has purchased for us at great cost through the death of his son. We can see they, they compromise our relationship with the Father. They're not compatible with his kingdom life, says John. Do not love the world, he says, for everything in the world comes not from the Father. But what does John here mean by the world? That he, want, that he warns us not to love. After all, in his gospel, John also tells us that God so loved the world. Well, put simply, that beautiful statement of Jesus in John 3.16, that Jesus comes to save the world by an initiative of love, is all about God's love for people, for you and me. Whereas in his letter, John is referring to the world as an evil system under the rule of Satan and not under the rule of God. Therefore, he says, God's people are not to love the things of this world because they have the potential to tempt us, to deceive us, and to even enslave us in a version of life that will take us away from the path of discipleship and ultimately cut us off from our relationship with God. Remember the lesson of Edmund's in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, as so he so easily succumbs to the temptation of Turkish delights. And whilst the culture of John's first century world is very different than our own, the temptations to love the things of this world are probably even greater. If you're old enough, many will remember that the mantra of the so-called permissive age of the 1960s was, if it feels good, do it. Then the mantra of the consumer age became, if it feels good, buy it. Now the mantra of the online age seems to be, if it feels good, click it. And with unlimited access to the internet, especially during the pandemic. Click it has become the way many of us do our shopping, our banking. It's where we look for our information. It might be where we read the news or perhaps express opinions through social media. But for all the benefits and for all the convenience of internet browsing, it has a dark underbelly. All those clicks that we may make are being monitored and they're being monetarized. Large companies are tracking you and me when we click. They are building profiles on you. They're closely watching your choices. And then they're bombarding you with suggestions of what to buy next all from the comfort of your armchair. But why does any of this matter? Well, it matters not least because personal credit card debt was at its highest level even before lockdown. And compulsive spending and shopping addiction is at epidemic proportions, not least because buying online 
has become so easy, so accessible, and credit so readily available. But of course, all of those problems are just the tip of the internet rabbit hole that we could probably have, to be honest, a whole sermon series on unpacking John's, John's warnings about love for the world in the internet age. And if you doubt that John's warnings are relevant and contemporary, think about those phrases that he uses, such as lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes. And that doesn't need much translating, does it? If we relate that to the awful things now available on the internet, again, just a click away, which especially men can become so destructively addicted to. Of course, the internet has many benefits. We couldn't be streaming this service to you today without the internet. It's straight into your homes, and we praise God for being able to do that and connect with everyone. But in terms of application of today's teaching from today's passage, the dark side of the internet plays a major role in exposing us as Christians to what the world values and what the world thinks is acceptable. Jesus gives a stern warning, doesn't he, about this incompatibility in one of his most well-known verses in the Gospels when he says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's Matthew 6, 24. Of course, some older versions have the word mammon in place of money. And that word was often used to describe something which is a false object of worship or devotion, which in our materialistic age is easy to see the connection. We cannot choose materialism, the world, and the Father. Because whatever takes the place of love for the Father, we cannot love both him and the world. So we have to be on our guard about the things of this world because we know who lies behind it. As Peter reminds us in his first letter, your enemy the devil prowls round like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So as Christians, how do we counteract the things of this world? Well, just briefly, two pieces of sound advice from St. Paul. Firstly, from 2 Corinthians 10, where Paul writes, Take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's verse 5. In other words, when thoughts and temptations of the world come our way, come into our minds, come to our screens, we need to recognize them for what they are and submit them to the mighty name of Christ. To put them through that filter, is this what Jesus would want me to see, to act upon? Remember, Jesus says he has overcome the world and his name is all-powerful because this is a daily battle for our mind, the world against him. And so the second piece of advice that Paul gives is from Romans 12 too. You'll possibly know this well. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
J.B. Phillips translates the first bit of that. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. And this whole idea of Christians being squeezed as we attempt to live out our faith in the world is so important because of the pressures we are subjected to to conform with the world's standards. Because those standards in the world around us are very, very different. And it takes a great deal of courage to take a stand and live out Christian standards today. That's why at the baptism service, we pray for the child or the adult candidate to be protected from the world, the flesh, and the devil, because those dangers are very present and very real. And that prayer is needed more than ever because there is a daily battle with the enemy for your soul. And that's why Jesus tells his disciples that we have to be prepared to take up our cross daily. It's a daily battle. And that's why Paul writes so passionately in Romans 7, isn't it? About his own inner battles and struggles because it's real. So every morning we have to be ready to pledge our allegiance to Christ. Who today will you serve? Because the pressure to conform is huge, particularly, I think, for young people. But remember, even though Jesus calls us to be distinctive and different, he doesn't call Christians to be weird and odd. He simply calls us to be the best version of the person he created and redeemed. So that's the first issue John has in this passage, that worldly life is incompatible with our love for the Father. And moving on to verse 17, the second issue he brings out is that worldly life is temporary, it's transitory, it's not forever. And I promise this point is much, much shorter. Back in February 1995, we took delivery of our first and ever only brand new car after our old Ford Escort came to the end of its life. And around that time, I'd been a little seduced by the TV advertising campaign for the VW Golf, which went something like, if only everything in life was as reliable as the VW Golf. Do you remember that? Well, 10 minutes after collecting the car and on the way home with just 12 miles on the clock, someone rear-ended us as we pulled up at some traffic lights. We also discovered a rattle in the engine and the glove box wouldn't close properly. It wasn't quite the promised reliability we'd been led to expect. But we went on to keep the car for 10 years and it did 120,000 miles when we traded it in. Is it still going? Sadly not. A quick check on the internet revealed that it only lasted a further two years after we handed it over, before it went to that great car graveyard in 2007. You see, the VW Golf doesn't last forever. And John's repeated warnings here caution us that worldly life and all it promises is temporary. It's transitory. It's not forever. And it's certainly not reliable. John writes, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Of course, the modern-day secular, secular humanists love to laugh at our trust in eternal life as pie in the sky and an outdated and ridiculous notion. 
That's why many of them are hedonists, people who invest all that they have in the empty pursuits of pleasure. Because for them, this worldly life is all they have. And deep down, they are some of the most miserable, hopeless people you could meet. And John tells us the truth in verse 17, that firstly, the world with its values is passing away. Like every human empire of the past, in God's time span of eternity, this world with all its false promises and temptations, is doomed. On the cross, Jesus overcame the grip of this world, which robbed humanity of hope and victory over sin and death. Jesus died and won a great victory. Jesus reigns. And that's the joy that we can celebrate this morning that Sarah spoke of earlier in the service. That deep-rooted joy that we know in the end, Jesus reigns. And through his grace and love, the one who obeys the will of God will live forever. Hallelujah. And again, John says, the world and its desires pass away but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And those words put me in mind of the worship song by Chris Tomlin, Forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. Forever. The writer of Psalm 1 our first reading that Val brought to us gives us a picture of a beautiful life of the one who seeks to please the Father and who rests in the promise of eternity he's given. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. may we seek to imitate that same life and experience the promise and assurance of a life with the Father forever. May we please pray. The world says, blessed are the fighters, the ladder climbers, the go-getters, the jet-setters. But Jesus, you call us to a better way. Jesus, would you please show me where I have been molded by the values of the culture around me and not by the upside-down values of the kingdom you came to bring. And Jesus, would you call me afresh today to your better way, which leads to eternity with the Father. Amen.